Hello, everybody. Great to be here. And I'm going to turn the conversation a little to a slightly different topic, but hopefully still very relevant. Um, okay, so let's jump in. We're going to talk about how circular procurement is really the missing link, particularly in Canada. For those of you who don't know much about HP, we are Canada's most sustainable technology company, and I would never make a bold claim like that without giving you all of the details and backup on that. Perhaps the one that's most relevant is that we're listed as one of the top 100 most sustainable corporations worldwide by Corporate Knights, our very own Canadian uh, ranking organization, but lots of other ratings and rankings. And I think um, it's great to be able to say this, but globally, we have a goal to be the world's most sustainable and just technology company by 2030. And I know we've been talking a little bit about the social impacts of things that we do. Sustainability does include those social things. And you can see uh, from a community or human rights perspective, we, we pay a lot of attention to that. But we're here talking about circularity today. So where is HP going from a circularity perspective? So by 2030, we want to reach a 75% circularity for products and packaging. And today we're at a, a 39% uh, circularity rate as measured using the Ellen MacArthur Circulitics tool. And we're very public about this. So that's a pretty, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, tall order to get from 39% to 75% in the next seven years. and. The reality is, as with anything in the circular economy, you cannot do this alone. <clears throat> Excuse me. You need all players in the economy to be coming with you. And just to keep us on our toes, in the meantime, while we're focusing on that, we have a 30% post-consumer plastics content requirement across our PC and print portfolio and eliminating 75% of single-use packaging by 2025. So those are keeping us pretty busy and uh, will help all of you contribute to the work that you do. So let's have a think about this. Uh, most Canadians live in a municipality that has declared a climate emergency. But if you went to look at how those uh, municipalities are buying, you will very rarely see the word carbon, circularity, or how much post-consumer recycled plastics is in that good or service that you're buying. Um, so we're missing the link between how we spend our public money and even just tackling things like a climate emergency, which uh, most Canadians and their councils have decided we are in an emergency. So why is that and how can we fix it? So let's start with the premise that the circular economy is not trying to fix a waste problem. We're actually trying to fix a design problem. The design problem is the design of the goods and services that go into the economy, but also how they are managed and sold and bought uh, before we get to the waste problem. Uh, I was lucky enough to sit on the expert panel on the circular economy. If you haven't read this report, I'd encourage you to do this. This was uh, at the request of the Minister of uh, Environment and Climate Change Canada. And this report showed very clearly that Canada has some room to do, to go in our um, circularity rate. So uh, I told you HP is 39% circular, Canada is just 6.1% circular. And the expert panel estimated that if we didn't do anything differently, we will have an increase in 40% of all of those uh, waste resource use and emissions, which of course is the exact opposite of what we need to be doing. So for over 30 years, municipalities, provinces have relied on extended producer responsibility to reduce waste and create circularity. And if you had to sit and think about it, how many millions, billions of dollars have we spent in Canada to get that 6.1% result? Hmm, probably a lot of money. So being a little bit controversial here, the definition of insanity is keeping doing the same thing and expecting different results. We really need to think about doing things differently. And the expert panel findings were that the top action for governments to take was to include circular principles into public procurement criteria. And I'm making this point uh, several times here because it simply is absent today. And I think if you sat and looked in the room that you're in today or the office that you're in uh, and you looked around at the number of items in there <clears throat> and asked how many meet the requirements of this bus shelter, excuse me, 
<clears throat> you'd probably say very few. And that's after 30 years of EPR. So, so what is it that will actually drive manufacturers and suppliers to do things to make the requirements of this bus shelter a reality? So I would argue that we have missed the opportunity to include sustainable circular procurement. And this is the definition that I use today, which comes from Bob Willard, uh, Canada's own grandfather of business sustainability. So we're still looking for the best value for money just not the tyranny of the lowest price. Now we're going to go after the most sustainable or circular services and goods, and obviously in the circular economy, it's about services, from the most circular or sustainable suppliers in support of your organization's purpose and strategic goals. And that uh, the last one is probably the one that gets least done. You may find uh, some procurements have a little bit of a, a nod to the, the service or, or good, uh, very rarely on suppliers and certainly not in alignment with your organization's goals. So how bad is it today? Um, I funded some research uh, that was academically published and we looked at 50 publicly available uh, RFP documents coming from all levels of government all across the country. And we assessed looking at bids that uh, RFPs that were for construction, information technology, and large services, which would be something like um, catering or security services. Uh, and that was at the recommendation of the federal government. And so, as you can see, 78% actually talked about sustainability, but less than half of them actually included any specific measurable things in the evaluation around sustainability. And if we actually looked more deeply at what they were measuring, uh, they were not independent items that were evaluated. And none of these 50 RFPs had su sufficiently good questions in there to actually pull the market to do more, to include more circularity. I'll just hammer this one home because this was a, a recent government bid that was for multiple millions of dollars for PCs. They asked for EPEAT, which is actually an eco label for PCs, and, and that's good to have in there, but it didn't say whether it was bronze, silver, or gold. They then asked for Energy Star, which is a requirement of EPEAT, so it was a wasted question. They asked some detailed packaging specs. That's pretty good, but if you look on the right hand side here at the pie chart, the emissions, if we're in a carbon constrained world, the emissions from packaging, uh, very, very small. So really not something we want to focus a lot on, but the kicker here is these questions were worth 15 points out of a total of 5,000. So any sane, logical business that is supplying to governments like this, is going to understand that sustainability is not important and not something you want them to focus on, sustainability or circularity. So it's a very short presentation, so I'm just going to jump into what can you do about this. The federal government just put in a requirement that all bids over 25 million, which is way too high and does need to come down and probably will, uh, all bids over 25 million, the vendors have to have measured, disclosed and set targets to re reduce their carbon emissions and drive for circularity. So you can do that tomorrow. And your next, your most, your best, most sustainable RFP is your next one. It's an iterative process. Uh, if most Canadians live in a jurisdiction that has declared a climate emergency, every single bid that goes out should require all vendors to do this. Shifting from buying boxes to buying services takes a partnership. I can offer to sell you a service, but you actually need to want to buy it. And it, it involves some different financing. You're going from CapEx to OpEx. Uh, and that's often where this falls down. Even if you have a vendor who's willing to sell you a service, uh, your internal systems don't allow that to happen. And I would be saying for municipalities, you know, you're in the business of doing this recycling, um, create a market for that recycling. My engineers, we have that 30% post-consumer recycled plastics goal. My engineers keep coming to me because they all want to do more. Francis, can you give me one RFP that has indicated that a customer really wants more post-consumer recycled plastics in the, in the goods that they're buying? And I do not have one in Canada. So there's my challenge to all of you really 
start to ask, it, it may not be possible to get it at the product level, but at least ask your vendors, what are their ambitions around plastics? Have they started doing some work on it? Do they know what their baseline is? Do they know what their circularity rate is? And of course, we started off talking about the social impact side of it. The circular economy has great opportunities for uh, adding social value into our economy. And you can do that yourself by asking every business that you choose to do business with, how are they, how are they supporting the Truth and Reconciliation Report? What are they doing on digital divide or hiring? Um, you can be asking these questions and, and you'll be interested to see what comes back. And you can get those questions in tomorrow but scoring it takes a little bit more effort, I know, but sending a signal into the marketplace that you intend to start scoring these. And our friend Bob Willard tells us that we need to get the scores up to about 30% to make it worth your suppliers while to actually invest in doing the changes that need to be done. Hmm. And you might be thinking, that's a lot, Francis. If the current score is less than 1%, how are we gonna get it up to 30%? our house is on fire. We literally have to do things very differently. And sending that signal into the marketplace is the, in a capitalist economy, is the best thing that we can do. So the fastest way to green your business or organization is to purchase from one that's already green there. So start holding your, your supplier's feet to the fires. Getting them to do more is, is critical here. And I will stop there right on time and open it up for questions, leaving you with a quote from uh, one of our founding fathers of the, you know, the purpose company, uh, HP, where every employee is enabled and encouraged to start to take action. And it's a responsibility to be shared by all. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Francis. Uh, really informative. I love this presentation. There is a question from the audience. From your experience, if you're a business that hasn't crafted a circularity strategy, where do you suggest they start? It's a great question. Mm, and actually Citra, just an S-I-T-R-A, World Circular Economy Forum, just today announced a guide for businesses that I was looking at. Um, there's quite a lot of good content in that. So I'd start there. Ellen MacArthur Foundation has tons of great resources. Um, some of them are free. I don't know if you necessarily have to join them as an organization. Uh, we are a member. Um, and Circular Innovation Council, uh, circularprocurement.ca has that we helped fund has got a bunch of resources there. And um, there is an organization, and I'm forgetting the acronym, Tim Reeve uh, of Reeve Consulting runs um, Canadian, I'll, I'll have to put it in the chat when I, when I jump off here, but um, that's a, a fairly low priced organization that you can join from mostly public sector members that uh, CCSP, Canadian Collaboration for Sustainable Procurement, that's what it is. And uh, they offer uh, collective help and assessments um, to get people started because it's, it can be scary to get started by yourself, but uh, there's lots of people working on this now.